We're going to begin our webinar today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, to the Antimicrobial Stewardship Project webinar series created by the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. I'm Dr. Marty Peterson, and I'll be your host for the webinar today. And today we have three amazing experts from Southeast Asia to speak to us about tracking drug-resistant infections. They'll be speaking in the order from left to right uh, about this topic. And I'd just like to briefly introduce them and then we'll get on with the webinar today. First speaking will be Professor Rogier Van Dorn. He's head of the Oxford University Clinical Research Laboratory in Hanoi, Vietnam. Second speaker today will be Diray Lima Thorot Sakul, Faculty of the Tropical Medicine, University of Thailand, also part of the Mahadol Oxford Tropical Medicine Research Unit. Finally, we'll hear from Posawat Jurakot. Southeast Asia Regional Microbiologist, also coming to us from Bangkok, Thailand. You see him there at the bottom right hand of your screen. So with that, I'm going to proceed. Uh, I have a few uh, details to cover before we begin. Some disclosures, this is part of our CE program this afternoon or this morning. And we just have some disclosures to, uh, well, actually no real, few or non-relevant disclosures to report, but this is part of the CE process from the clinical care options, our CE provider. As you can see there, most of the people that contributed to the, this program or our speakers had no relevant conflicts of interest to report. Uh, Dr. Van Dorn has disclosed that he's received consulting fees in the past from Sanofi Pasteur. And we'd like to thank Dr. Christine Moore from our SIDRAP team for the peer review process. So this is just to dis disclose that this is an educational activity and that may contain discussion of published or investigational uses of agents that are not indicated by the FDA and the planners of the activity do not recommend the use of any agent outside of labeled indications. And these are the opinion and, and ideas and thoughts of our speakers today. Our target audience is all of you, clinicians, physicians, pharmacists, and we're happy to provide this educational program to you with the following learning objectives, and they'll be covered in this order by our speakers. We will outline the current diagnostic and surveillance tools available for combating antimicrobial resistance. Then we will discuss the use of surveillance data to inform antimicrobial stewardship policies, and finally discuss how increasing Laboratory capacity and diagnostic testing can improve the ability to generate, collect, and regularly report antimicrobial resistance surveillance data. Finally, this program is funded and brought to you as an educational grant from BD, Becton Dickinson Company. So we thank them for funding this educational grant so we are able to bring this to you today. This is the CE that we're offering. We're offering um, ACPE for pharmacists. We're offering 1.25 contact hours. And we are also offering um, ACCME, so continuing education for physicians. To receive this educational component, you'll go to our CE provider, www.proce.com. And I will show you this again at the end of this webinar. Um, and you'll complete a post-test and evaluation after viewing this webinar, the deadline for receiving your, your CE is you have to take this post-test by May 14th. And there's attendance code that you will need that we provide at the end of the webinar for you. So I'll make sure that you receive that. The following is before we begin is we really wanna engage with all of you. You've got these brilliant speakers in front of you. So as you have questions or comments, we've reserved 25 minutes of this total time together for you to engage with them with the Q&A session at the end of our presentation. So all three speakers will present and then we'll head in right into our Q&A and I will be your moderator. So you're able to provide your questions and comments via a chat box on this Zoom 
uh, software, which is at the bottom right hand side of your screen there. So with that, we're gonna begin with Dr. Rogier Van Dorn. He's going to be giving us an overview for antimicrobial resistance surveillance coming from Vietnam. Welcome Dr. Van Dorn. Thank you, Arnie. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Gautier van Doorn. I'm a clinical microbiologist. Um, I've been working in Vietnam since 2007 and doing uh, a lot of work on antimicrobial resistance surveillance. And that is what I want to talk to you about. If you go to the next slide, please, Marnie. Yes. So before we dive into um, surveillance, I always like to show uh, the following two slides. And this is sort of the general feel about what infectious diseases were going to look like uh, in the time that I was born. And if you read these quotes, you see that there was a lot of optimism and the idea that infectious diseases would soon be a thing of the past with the rollout of numerous classes of antibiotics and the use of various different vaccines. Uh, I, I, I crossed out the top one because it was actually never attributable to William H. Stewart, the US Surgeon General, but it's, it's attributed to him quite a lot in a lot of textbooks, but he never, probably really never said it. Anyway, the other two are indicative enough to, uh, to talk, to show about what the, what the common feel was in those days. But then of course, HIV happened and currently we're living two, through two pandemics, one of COVID-19 obviously, and the other slower pandemic of drug resistant infections and AMR. So not quite as dull as was anticipated in those days. Next slide, please. Another general slide for background, just some, some facts, some big and important facts about antibiotic resistance and drug resistance infections. Um, antibiotics have existed for a very long time. Uh, bacteria and fungi have been battling for territory in our soil uh, of the earth for millions, if not billions of years, and they used antibiotics to do that. And they used antibiotic resistance genes to protect themselves from those. So these have also been around for a really long time and most of them in our current healthcare systems are selected um, because of antibiotic use and not necessarily newly evolving, evolving or emerging in the majority of cases. Antibiotics are a natural resource, also the way we use them. So every time we use them, be it appropriate or inappropriate, that eats away a little bit of, of its potential for future use. And an and, uh, and, um, analogy of that is the, the tragedy of the commons, which I won't go into further, but you can read about if you like. AMR is a wicked problem, also an official term um, that you can read about more. Um, that means that it has various different stakeholders, that there are various different processes um, uh, involved and that there is no simple solution, but that a lot of things have to be balanced um, and interventions have to be balanced to, to slowly move the problem in the right direction. And what makes it so complicated and wicked, if you like, is that antibiotics have become part of our societal and healthcare infrastructure and losing our ability to rely on them will have profound consequences. For instance, if we don't have working antibiotics for surgical prophylaxis, we cannot do surgery anymore. And AMR is a pandemic at the moment. Drug resistant infections and AMR are a pandemic um, that has been, have been among us and will be among us for quite a while. But it's a different pandemic than COVID-19. And um, Sally Davis, um, one of the important voices of AMR, has made the uh, comparison with uh, throwing a lobster in boiling water, which is a very hectic and um, uh, intense um, uh, happening. So COVID-19, very acute and uh, emerging and, 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 and uh, acute pandemic and then the other on the other side boiling a frog in water that starts at room temperature slowly and um, the story is that the frog doesn't realize that the water is boiling until it's too late and that is what we compare AMR with. Okay that's background some facts about AMR let's start about AMR surveillance next slide please. So if we talk about AMR surveillance uh, one of the first things to ask yourself is if we do surveillance what do we really want to know why do we do AMR surveillance? And the things that are usually listed are four is that we want to do surveillance because we're interested in the epidemiology and the burden of something. Uh, we're interested in changes or differences in space and time and, um, and in emerging new things. Uh, we want to do surveillance to make benchmarks so that we can see what the effect is of interventions that we're going to do. And specifically for AMR, we're interested in doing surveillance because we want to be able to have data that we can use um, 
for, for making clinical guidelines and for clinical decision making. A lot of the AMR surveillance we do um, gives us proportions of resistant pathogens against a specific antibiotic. That's the, the outcome of most of the surveillance systems. And I'll, I'll go through some of them with you um, um, in, in the next few slides. Um, and that's important information, but there are also problems with that. And I will talk about that as well uh, and about potential solutions. Next slide, please. This is probably the picture about AMR that has been shown and discussed the most. It's from a report from Lord uh, O'Neill, and it states that currently we see about 700,000 deaths per year of AMR. And if no appropriate interventions are done, by 2050, this may be 10 million per year. And that's a big number, and that's why it's used a lot because it it gives it gives a you know, it's a indicative of the of the gravity of the situation and how something needs to be done. But there are also a few issues with this estimate. It's there's a lot of assumptions and there's a lot of extrapolation. And the paper that I've shown the title of uh, in the in the bottom of the slide and um, goes through those one by one. And it's an, an interesting read to get some background on where that number comes from and and that it may or may not be very accurate. And, and how we need to do very good surveillance actually to come to better estimates of that number. Next slide, please. If you then further look into that number of 10 million, you will see that um, the number of deaths will be unevenly distributed over the world and, and the low middle income, <coughs> sorry, low and middle income countries in Africa and Asia will be disproportionately affected. And then if you look even further into it, um, next slide, please. Most of those estimates come from extrapolation from data from the EU and the US. Um, but recently we've had some additional data added to it from uh, low and middle income countries in the region. And one of those papers about Thailand was uh, authored by the next speaker. Um, and those, and then you see that you can't just extrapolate those data from high income countries because already the numbers are higher in low and middle income countries or even if we already think it's going to be disproportionately affecting those countries in reality it will probably be even worse in terms of disproportionately next slide please so that's about burden and mortality and, and estimates and extrapolation and the data that we have, the data that we use, and how we talk about it. Um, I want to go through a number of surveillance systems now, how they collect data, what sort of data they generate now one by one, and then uh, talk about Vietnam a little bit in the end. Um, so traditionally, the, the, the AMR surveillance data that we see looks like what, what I will show you in the next slide. And this is an example called EarsNet and CSAR. They do surveillance in Europe and in Central Asia and Eastern Europe. They focus on blood and CSF for um, culture of bacteria sent in, in, uh, sent in for diagnostics in hospitals. They look at a number of pathogens that represent the most important pathogens for infections acquired in the community or in the hospital. And the data that we see is the data that I talked about earlier. It's proportion of a pathogen resistant to a specific drug and I've added some details there below that will become more important later. So I'll skip that for now and it will become clear why that's important uh, in, my, in my later slides. Next slide, please. And then this is what you get from, from those sorts of data. So we see a, a number of different countries. We see that this is about E. coli and we see that this is about resistance against third generation cephalosporins. And we see different colors that indicate different proportions that are resistant. We see a gradient from left to right. It becomes worse when we move to the east. So you may be also a gradient going from north to south. Um, and so we know that in a given country, an X percentage of a bug is resistant to a drug. And the next slide is another example for Klebsiella pneumoniae resistant to carbapenems, and we see similar gradients and slightly lower proportions. Next slide, please. And so th that, that was a, a regional uh, initiative, and there are several of those regional networks. Um, there is a global effort from uh, the WHO called GLASS, 
um, that was um, initiated in 2015, I believe. And they try to bring together all those networks and collect um, data globally on AMR. Um, they look at a little bit more than only blood. They look at four different samples. And the surveillance that they do is also mostly based on, uh, on isolates, um, although there is guidance to do surveillance with a bit more clinical data collected around them. For instance, sample-based, where you look at all the different uh, isolates from a different sample, like blood, like urine, like feces, um, or even case-based by collecting more clinical met metadata so that you can make the data more valuable. Again, I'll come back to that later um, to, 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 to say why that is important and why those proportions are not um, are, are important, but are not everything that you need to get all your information from surveillance. Um, next slide, please. So currently, uh, per May 2020, 92 countries are enrolled into GLASS. Um, unfortunately, Vietnam not yet, but um, we're working on that, um, also with the Fleming Fund and other, and other initiatives, and that, will, that goes for more countries uh, in, in the region and also in Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, next slide, please. And so most, most of the data generated and most of the countries submit their data in the way that we looked at earlier in the, 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 the EARSnet and the CSER data. But some countries uh, give more information. They do the data collection in a truly sample-based manner. And this is data from uh, Thailand. And we're looking at, um, I think we're looking at blood. It doesn't really matter. It, it, it's, it's about the principle. So we, we're looking at one specific sample. So over here, we're looking at blood. So we're looking at bloodstream infections. And then you get a percentage of the different pathogens. And then per pathogen, you get the different percentages of resistance uh, against the different drugs. And so with this combination of, of data, you can start looking at, okay, so if I have a patient with a bloodstream infection, in my situation, how should I treat this patient? So here you come closer to being able to use this data immediately um, for clinical decision making, because you're not just looking at one uh, bug anymore, you're looking at a sample, you're perhaps even looking at a syndrome, that's where the data becomes more valuable. Uh, next slide, please, Marnie. And another way, a more systematic way of doing that is called uh, WISCA. And that's basically the same as what I showed in the previous slide, but it's a, it's a set algorithm um, using the same data um, from one sample, different pathogens and the, per the percentages in which they are isolated and the resistance proportions against different drugs. And then the WISCA sort of produces an empiric um, treatment with a percentage of estimated um, how often it will be successful if you don't know yet which pathogen um, is causing the disease in your patient. So WISCA is an algorithm that uses proportion of different bugs and proportions of their resistances to come to a proposed treatment regimen that is optimal in that particular situation. So that's one way of, of working with just those proportions and then going from those data to an actual advice for, for treatment of patients. So practical use of AMR surveillance data. Next slide, please. And this is just another example that I won't go in too deeply but it's because it's quite complicated, um, but it's called, it's another way of using data that you can then use immediately. It comes from the manufacturing industry where you don't use all the data from a hospital or a surveillance network, but you, you sample a lot that is um, representative in a way that you've decided it needs to be. And then with that sample um, that, that's representative, you can say something about which drug is highly resistant, low resistance, or et cetera. So you, you, you do a representative smaller sample than you would normally do. And with that, you get information that you could use for, for bigger things. Um, again, try, have a look at the paper if you're interested. It's a, it's a different way of doing surveillance, but uh, efficient and useful. And then if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so we've talked about, we've talked about the, the, the regular surveillance network, we've talked about glass, we've talked about other ways of looking at data. And then um, now we're going to look at this protocol, which also from the WHO, which is trying to add more uh, relevant data to surveillance um, 
adding clinical metadata so that you go from those resistant percentages to actually saying something about uh, the burden and the epidemiology of drug resistant infections. So this is the attributable mortality protocol from the WHO. Um, for this moment, looking only at ESBLs, so that's a third generation cephalosporin resistance in gram negative Enterobacteriaceae and metisolin resistance in Staph Staphylococcus aureus, where they will not just only collect the percentages of resistance, but will enroll patients prospectively with either a drug resistant infection or a drug susceptible infection or with no infection uh, and then um, apart from the resistance, also look at uh, outcome, clinical metadata, clinical syndrome, et cetera. So you can get better data to say something about the actual burden of drug resistant infections as opposed to drug susceptible infections. And the next slide, please. And just for the last few minutes, um, I don't think I have a lot left if I look at my time. Uh, just some... Um, some details about the work we've been doing in Vietnam. And you can see a similar evolution going from resistant proportions to trying to say something about burden. Uh, this is one of my PhD students, uh, Jung. He just uh, got his PhD actually uh, on surveillance in Vietnam. And these are some of the different projects that have been going on in Vietnam since 1998 and still ongoing um, to say something about the burden of drug resistant infections in Vietnam. And the things I want to specifically talk about are the Vineris network and our ACORN project. So in the next slide, please. Our unit here, the, the Oxford University Clinical Research Unit in collaboration with hospitals here and the Swedish university have established a surveillance network in Vietnam consisting of 16 provincial and national level hospitals. And in that project, we collect the data on antibiotic resistance and antibiotic use by using the data from the lab and doing surveys on antibiotic use. And the next slide, please. Next slide, please, Marnie. So we got 16 hospitals, um, and we recently added uh, a number of uh, STD clinics as well to be able to say something about resistance in the Syria gonorrhea that we were missing otherwise, and that is one of the the target pathogens of the of the glass um, protocols. And the next slide, please, Marnie. Next slide. Yeah. And here to show you some data from that network um, from 2016, 17. There's more data available now, but I'm showing you this one because I haven't seen haven't seen the other ones yet. The network was taken off, was recognized by the Ministry of Health in uh, 2016 and is now managed uh, under a Fleming Fund uh, country grant um, together with the US CDC in Vietnam and uh, PATH in Vietnam. I'm showing you data when, when we were still running it as OCRU. So these are, again, proportions of resistance for important pathogens and important drugs. Um, as you can see in Vietnam, it's pretty high, 60% uh, of Acinobacter resistant to imipenem, 40% of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, the same. We see 20% um, of Klebsiella already resistant to imipenem, 60% of E. coli having ESBLs, 70% um, of Staph aureus being MRSA. So they're very high percentages. And this is in blood and CSF. It's a little bit higher in the other, in the other specimens. And I put other countries next to it uh, for comparison. But it's, it's, the, the percentages are high in Vietnam relatively to um, our, in, uh, our, our region as well. Next slide, please. So in this, when when we so when we got those data from that network and we wanted to start using those data, particularly for treatment guidelines and empiric treatment, we looked at the data a little bit better and we realized a number of things. And this is probably the most important slide of my presentation. Um, in Vietnam and in a lot of low and middle income countries, not everyone who comes in with an infection and not everyone who receives intravenous antibiotics has a culture done. So there's an underuse of microbiology. Um, probably the patients who are more severe or, unresist or unresponsive to initial treatment have a higher chance of being, uh, of being cultured. Um, there's also in the hospitals that we work with a high percentage of patients who are transferred from other hospitals and are probably already on antibiotics when they come in. And that means that the susceptible organisms will already have been killed by the antibiotics, but the resistant organisms haven't. And then there is no distinction between hospital and 
community acquired infections, whereas we know that hospital acquired infections are more resistant. So all these things taken together, they bias the sample we have, and they all bias towards resistance. So if we use those data for treatment, we are probably going to give an advice to treat with more antibiotics than really is necessary. And that would make that we contribute to the problem of resistance rather than to the solution. So we need to have better data to be able to use it immediately for, um, for treatment. And then I will go very quickly to my last few slides. So, so these thinking about this um, with my colleague, Paul Turner, who works in uh, Cambodia as a clinical microbiologist, we came up with the idea of ACORN. And ACORN is a way of doing surveillance that is compatible with glass, um, where we not only collect the data from the lab, but we try to combine it with clinical data so that we have clinical denominators and that we can say something about resistance per syndrome, per group of patients. Uh, next slide, please, Marnie. So what, what is added to ACORN is that we actually collect data from the patient back bedside on a tablet on day 0, 3, and 28. We collect outcome data as well so that we know whether a patient died from an infection or not. We do active diagnostic stewardship on the wards to make sure that patients get sampled, that everyone who has an infection or gets IV antibiotics gets sampled. And we offer some software solutions to make this uh, process easier. So we have tablets to collect data. We have a custom-made lens that can be used um, to collect the data or, or, or WhoNet. And we provide middleware to link the data from the lab to the, to the clinical data. Um, next slide, please. So we've, we've locked up a couple of people, a couple of specialists in a room to come up with 10 clinical var variables that we need to select. The maximum was 10. That was the only limitation we gave them. So these data are now uh, collected in, uh, in ACORN when we run it. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an, an example of what, what the tablet looks like, where, we, where, where the doctors can, can enter the 10 clinical variables. Next slide, please. ACORN is meant to be very simple and very scalable. We've piloted it recently in three different hospitals and we've received funding to roll it out further in nine countries and in 15 different hospitals. And what's really nice about it is that the data is immediately can immediately be visualized on an app that we also provide to the hospitals where we run it. So the doctors have a tablet, they enter the data, the lab data is combined with it. And then after it's combined, it can immediately all be taken together and visualized per bug, per sample, per syndrome um, for, for, for direct feedback and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and information for the doctors who are gathering the data as well. Next slide, please. And so we've piloted this, um, the small acorn, and we're now uh, in the stage where we are getting into a little tree. And when that is successful, hopefully uh, the acorn will become an oak tree. And that's my last slide. I hope I stuck to time reasonably. Um, and this is, uh, a bunch of influenza viruses, which was my previous um, professional hobby, uh, shaped in the form of a question mark. I'll take any questions later, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rajir. And I'm sure we'll have many questions. Um, I have a few myself. Um, just the development of ACORN there is quite remarkable and, and how you're able to start to aggregate all that data. So we'll get, we'll get into that. Uh, we're going to move to the next slide, so I'm going to stop sharing because we're going to do a, a video handoff here. And I'm going to hand it off to DeRay. He's going to share his slide and presentation. And we're doing great on time because I took up at least five minutes of your, of your time, so with the intro. Okay, so I can start now. You can go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Honey. Okay, so this is the presentation about how to build knowledge and trust in surveillance data to inform policy. And I would like to uh, thank an uh, organizer and my author colleagues and uh, sponsors and funders who contrast Faculty of Tropical Medicine, University of Oxford, Department of Defense USA, Ministry of Public Health, Thailand. And because I was asked to how to inform and talk with the, oh, yeah, I need to hide floating meeting control. Okay. To ask to talk, how to talk with the policy makers and how to influence policy makers. I think the first thing that I would like to remind everyone is just start with how to talk with them. 
and it's my embarrassing history that when I was young, I thought that we do a lot of research, we publish papers, we go show them the papers and told them they should do this. It never works. And, uh, and then I learned it. But of my experience, how we can talk with them better over time. And this slice and uh, link, you, when you have time, you should go to look into it and try to think that there is a full course about policy engagement. And this from the ODI and the Wellcome Trust. Uh, this is just, a, I take it only the first one, be gentle. Don't just go to the policy makers and say that you are wrong, I am right, do this. It never work. So you have to learn how to speak, how to talk with them, how to uh, initiate the discussion, how to propose the study or the way how to solve the problems. Every institutions, every organizations have their own policy, have their own banners. Maybe you can call that they have their own agenda. They have their trust that they have to keep for the public. So you have to all aware of that. And if you understand the barriers and the drive, then you can work with them better and you can push or make a change better than just uh, go and ask them to do what you want. So that's the first step. The second, I think that for the AMR surveillance and in, in many workplaces, when you want to talk and inform the policy, I think it most of the time you have to start with to gain your credibility first and form a network because the voice of you alone normally is weaker than the voice of the bigger network. You can start your own network or you can be a part of a big networks already. This is the work that Rohia said that in the eLife paper by Shirley that we formed a small network at first from the nine hospitals in Northeast of Thailand. We did a study that we used the data from microbiology laboratories uh, from the hospital admission database, we merge it and we develop and generate uh, antimicrobial surveillance report for that nine hospitals. We combine it and we extrapolate, I call extrapolate, to estimate the death attributable to AMR for the whole country using the model at that time that are the best we can. And we estimated that 19,000 of the people in Thailand die attributable to AMR infection. So that's the work that showed uh, the development of the data, how to use the data, how you form the network. And when we have the data, and it's not only just one single paper, you have to gain a lot more momentum into it, right? And one of the things that Rohe here present about the bias. This is one of the work that I would like to, to give you some more information as well, just release. Uh, actually, this year, Journal of Infection, it's about impact of low blood culture usage. Everyone told about the, uh, the bias that could cause by low blood culture utilization, but how big the impact would look like. And with this uh, data, it's only from one large hospital in Northeast of Thailand. And I show you that if you do blood culture less and less and less, how would it look like? This is the data. Uh, from the hundred, using the hundred percent of the data from the hospital, and this is the percentage of the uh, third generation cephalosporin system entero, uh, sorry, uh, E. coli among blood culture positive for E. coli, and this is the incidence rate per hundred thousand population per year, and we simulate the data that if you draw blood culture less during the first blood culture, but we keep all repeated blood culture data to represent if you do blood culture less and you delay the blood culture and draw blood culture later when they severe or they don't improve. So we show you that if in Thailand, in that single hospital, if you draw blood culture less by half, the percentage of the resistance rows and rows and rows. And actually, if you split the criteria by the WHO class, of the community origin infection and hospital origin infection, the percentage that changed the most is in the hospital origin infection. And you can see that the estimated percentage of the 3GCREC could rise up to 27% because you draw blood culture less. And the incidence rate, which is count by the total number divided by 100,000 population per year, 
And you can see that because you found less and less cases, the incidence rate decline, but the proportions rise. So this is a situation that can uh, cause by bias. And more information, you can look into the papers and also talk about the situation when you don't draw by culture immediately and you start ceftriaxone, not improve melopinem. Don't improve melopinem plus another two drugs. Okay, another two days, don't improve, don't die. Okay, one blood blood culture. So that scenario most likely would pop up to be this high proportion, but low incidence from the data of your hospital. So with this work, it gives you the idea that no data is perfect. One hospital data is never be perfect. And you cannot do blood culture for everyone that you want to in every uh, situation. And uh, parameters like blood culture utilization is important as well. Okay, so that's the issues. But then when you work with the policy makers and when you want to uh, inform the policy, whether you want to just publish the paper, do they trust the paper or they trust in the data? And even you yourself, you do you trust the paper of your friends or you trust the data of uh, the other hospitals in the countries? So I will start it with some simple question. If you are listening to this, uh, I'm not so sure which they call podcast or the seminar. I assume that most of you are researchers, clinicians, or microbiologists. Even if you are not in the hospital, but let's assume that if you are in the hospital in your country, if you are working with, do you have a microbiology lab in your hospital? I assume that most of your answer is yes. Then the next one. Have you seen AMR surveillance report of the last year, 2020, of your hospital yet? If you are in the room now, I would like to ask you to raise your hand if you have seen it. And I doubt that more than half have seen it. I guess that only 10% of the room have seen the anti biogram report or AMR surveillance report of the last year already. And if you have seen it, did your report split into the community acquired versus hospital acquired as a division of class recommended already or not? And did they estimate or show you the mortality? How many die when they have the third generation cephalosporin resistant E. coli infection or not? Because those are the data that, as Rokia said, is really important for the policymakers, for us to understand the burden of the AMR to guide the antibiotics. Most of and many other things. And that is a big issue, right? And this is already April, four months, why the data on the report is not available from your, from your hospital for you yourself to look into it. So that's come to, uh, to one of another our research project that we also do our research and we publish the paper and we work with the policy makers as well. Then we think that if every hospital in the world has to produce AMR report every year. Why there is no automation system or automatic system to produce the PDF report to serve you immediately within three minutes? And why the data is not being sharing? Why, is, why your AMR surveillance report is not in a data depository system? So we spearhead and we show you that project and how it can work out. So I think every hospital would like to see the report as beautiful like this. For your hospital having the beautiful graph, percentage of resistance, and by the uh, sample base or the isolated base. And when possible, you show the mortality of that as well. And it should be in the PDF as well, I think, because uh, as, as a doctor or microbiologist, we want it to be printed out, hand in, or pass the PDF file so that you can look into it quickly and you can use it to ref refer to many other things. So we developed the application. We put it uh, on the data depository. It's free. You can download it. All details are at this website. And if you forget anything, you please remember the website and you can look into more details. And what I'm showing you is already showing in the YouTube that on the website as well. So by the concept, it should be simple, isn't it? That you just download the application 
and you try to obtain your Excel data set in your hospital. You don't have to pass it to anyone outside of your hospital. Go to microbiology laboratory, ask them to export the data into Excel for you. If you can, go to hospital emission data, uh, export as an Excel to you in your hospital. And then you might have to configure the data dictionary a little bit. And it's in the Excel format. Why we have to do that? Because every hospital doesn't name the variable in the same way. For example, gender. Some hospital might call it sex, some hospital might call it gender. When you export the data and found, it might not be male, female, it might be M, F, it might be zero and one. So that the data dictionary in the Excel format will make our application understand your data set. And we don't ask you to understand the R program, statistical program or full net program in details. You just double click the application, three minutes, you get the PDF report. You get a summary data in the, P in the Excel format. And then you can consider yourself whether you would like to share it to everyone in your hospital or deposit it into data depository or even share it to your national uh, committee on the AMR and international colleagues. So now I'm going to show you how we can make the report within three minutes. Okay, that's, oh, okay. I, I have to find a way how I can share it, but oh man, this is the same. Uh, sorry, Maya and Manny, I have some uh, split issues. Okay, okay, good. Now I can reshare my screen, thank you. I'm going to show you how the application works. So now I share, if you download the application to the website, you will get the zip file. When you unzip file, you will get the whole package in the folder called a mess. When you look into the folder, there will be lead me text that you can read in more details. And you can go into the application. The real application is this file. And we have example data set for you so that you can test it. So the way to work with, if you want to test it, you copy it and you put it in the same folder like this. And this represents your microbiology data set in Excel. This represents your hospital emission data set in Excel. If you don't have hospital emission data set, it's fine. It's a tier based approach. Even if you have only microbiology data, the program will show something for you. And I just double click the application and then when you do that, the new window will pop up and it's an R program, which is a free program. It will automatically do the analysis, merge the two files together, microbiology data set, hospital emission data set, deduplicate the microbiology results per isolate, per observation period, and generate a beautiful PDF for you. It will take about one minute in the uh, high speed computer and about two or three minutes in the uh, cheap computer that we have been testing so far. It works on Windows 10 and Windows 7. And then I think that's okay, it's done. Then after you finish, you will get the beautiful PDF file like this pop up in your folder. And then when you double click, it, you will see the new files of the PDF and you can put the hospital name, your country name into the report and you get the PDF report and it will be beautiful. It's quite similar to how the glass report look like. We have a graph, we have percentage, we show numerator and denominator for each percentage and it's a tier base. So if your data is uh, even have the hospital mortality data, uh, like uh, the discharge status in your hospital emission data, the PDF will go up to the mortality involving AM or infection for you. And this is the uh, summary data out. Okay, now I will come back. So, So I will, okay, that's good. So in the MS, the concept that we do is that it's fully open access. The program is free to download, CCBY, you can modify it if you like. It uses freely, you just double click the application. You don't need to know R, that program. 
is highly compatible because it's work with the database that is in Excel and CSV. You just export it out from whatever program you are using, Hunet, or Microsoft Excel, Microsoft Access, or your hospital limbs. It's very high data security because you don't need the internet when you run the program. It can be run within your hospital. You don't have to transfer your data to anyone. So it's, uh, the data security is as good as your hospital data security. You get PDF, it's easy to use the output and so that you can share, you can share PDF and you can share summary anonymous Excel, which is just from the table immediately. Does it work? Yes, we show it as a proof of concept. We work in seven hospitals in seven countries. All the details of the programs and applications has been uh, published. And within the papers, we show the data from seven hospitals. We work it out. We develop the PDF AMR report from those seven hospitals. You can see Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, and one from UK. And all deposit in the fixed share database. And in the paper, we also talk about that it's much better to share the data and people shouldn't criticize the hospital why the data is low, why the data is high, there are a lot of bias. And you should, actually you should try to give a, a compliment to the hospital that, and, and the, uh, the people who share the data because I think that's the way the world would move to. Then the next one, the last point about it, I would like to say, if you want to, change policies. I think the best way is not work against the policy makers. Whenever possible, you should work with policy makers. It's not all the time, but whenever possible, you should consider it. For example, in Thailand, our national antibiograms so far is uh, are open access as well, and it's run by the Department of Medical uh, Science, and you can go to the website, you can download it. It's one of the uh, best things for the upper middle income countries that show the data of the antibiogram uh, in the open access format as well. But even that, the data from the each hospital is still not quick enough. And with the WHO class moving for the mortality, moving for the hospital acquired versus community acquired, the next generation of the uh, Thailand data system is going to be, they call ALICE AMR, the information sharing system. It's not launched officially yet, but we are working with them to uh, uh, communicate advice and support in any way. We are not replacing them. We know and we tell them that we are not reinvent the wheel and we support them. So we also work with a list with the Department of Medical Science to be uh, another way for the hospital data in each hospital so that they can get the report first and they can uh, cross check with the data from a list as well. At least use quite an own system that you upload everything to the data center in Bangkok, and then you got the report back, which can take in the reality months before they got the, the individual hospital data back. But with a mask, you can get it within three minutes, as I show you. So that's the first one. And the second one, actually, if we can get the data from microbiology repository with all bacterial culture, if you can do it for the AMR, can you do it for the notifiable bacterial disease as well? Shigella, Salmonella, of course, is also AMR. But what about others? Diphtheria, gonorrhea, and step suis, Viplio, Bacteria pseudomeriae. This is the list of the important and uh, can be culture confirmed that bacterial disease in Thailand. And we are expanding the next uh, spin off of the AMES to call AMES Plus that in a report on top of the AMR report, we can add the report of the notifiable bacterial disease as well. Of course, we also talk with the Ministry of Public Health that we are not replacing what the, their system, but we allow the local hospital to generate the report themselves first, and then they can deposit into the data depository, and then Ministry of Public Health can use it to refer it and cross-check with their system. So this one is also support by the defense and we work with the Department of Disease Control to try to uh, develop it, implement it and work it into make it as a research and make it as a routine work of the country as well. So I think that is about the time and that's all from my whole presentation. And in summary, I think that I hope one, you learn how to talk with the policy makers 
go back and 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 if you have time, look into the website, look into the cost of policy engagement. More, I think it's important. And to work with the AMR, with the policy makers, you need to. Uh, I, I love the word this. Promise less, deliver more, and making a paper is not a bad thing because it gives you the credibility that you are the delivery guy. You can deliver the outcome. You promise less, and you show the outcome output and you form a network or be part of big networks and try to use the tools whenever available. And I think more than the papers, you should show the data and share the data as well. Because Mr. our public health, our policy makers and the people, we would love to see the real data and with the real, uh, the people who work on the field. And actually with the MS application, I, I have the motto of the local first, when I developed the program, because I want the local hospital to have the report first before they pass the data to anyone or before they ask anyone to develop the data to them or generate a guideline for them. They should be the one who see their own data first and use it as much as they can and then consult and work with the higher level. And then if you are researchers, if you are uh, the scientists, the key is that work with policy makers when possible, work against them is not quite helpful actually, based from my embarrassing experience and I think with many people. And if you forget anything today, visit our website and read the paper about a mess. Thank you. Thank you so much for transitioning. That was terrific. And thank you for the live presentation to the demonstration. Uh, um, Pasawa, are you able to okay. share your slides next? Okay. Uh, I'm sure that now you see my screen. That's, yes. Uh, uh, welcome everyone. I'm Pasawat Jaraget. I'm Soit AC Regional Microbiologist, Mount McDonald Company, Filming Fund Management Agent. Uh, my background is a uh, laboratorian. So today I will talk, explain to you about uh, what is the importance of the improving the laboratory capacity and the agnostic testing to generate the correct and regular report, MR surround data. Okay. Uh, from Professor Rogier and Professor Direk speaking, uh, you know all of the key facts in the website that uh, how the MR is important. And because of those reasons, MR is everyone fight. And the uh, UK Department of Health and Social Care, uh, UK government, runs the UK aid program called the Framing Fund, which is a uh, 265 million pounds to support low and middle income countries to, to generate share and use antimicrobial resistance data to reduce drug resistance. And we work with the uh, 24 priority country across the Africa and Asia. In uh, Southeast Asia, we work with Laos, Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, Papua New Guinea and Timor Leste. From Dr. Direk presentation, you know that uh, the data is the powerful to talk with the uh, policy maker to change their mind, their mind and to support the MR surveillance. How is uh, data become to the MR surveillance? It starts from the clinical team when the patient admit to the hospital and clinician suspect the infectious disease uh, they will order the uh, laboratory testing and send the specimen to the laboratory team. And the laboratory will testing and provide the result back to the clinical team for the patient treatment. In the same time, the laboratory will send the result to the surveillance team. And surveillance team also got the uh, patient clinical data from the clinical team. And they will analyze and provide the report uh, MR surveillance data, and it's submit to the national MR surveillance system. 
And if the country see the importance of the MRP uh, data and willing to share the international community like the grass system. In the same time, MR7 data can use for the empirical treatment guideline and also for the local MR control strategy. Because of the importance of the data that we can use to tackle the MR, uh, for Ming Fun, we support the five area for uh, to improve the MR data analysis. The first one is laboratory infrastructure enhancement, human resource strengthening, surveillance system strengthening, and the building foundation for the surveillance data use. And the last one about the original use of the antimicrobial medicine. To improve the laboratory capacity, uh, we have fighting that uh, it's important to improve the laboratory capacity. The first thing we can use the lesson from Professor Dilek's talk about the how to talk with the policy maker to find the support for the budget and strategic plan to the laboratory. Because if we lack of the support from the management or executive team, we cannot get the budget and we have no strategic plan, then we can not uh, improve our the laboratory capacity. After we got the support from the management, we get the budget, we, we get the strategic plan. Then we need to think about the human resources that we have enough, res enough human resource and enough qualified people. And then we need to think about the infrastructure because if we have budget, we have human resources, but we have no suitable the facility and IT infrastructure, then we cannot uh, make the we cannot generate the data, and also we cannot collect and analyze the data. After we have the infrastructure, human resources, and management support, we just think about the diagnostic testing that. What is the testing suitable for our the laboratory? We need to think about the size of our laboratory. We need to think about the uh, number of the patient of our hospital. We need to think about our law of the laboratory. Like uh, we can separate between national reference laboratory and also for the hospital laboratory. Both laboratory is different law. We need to think uh, what is the suitable testing for our laboratory. For the laboratory testing for the AMR, it's very basic laboratory like a program stand, culture identification, AST or PCR or whole genome sequencing for the, for PCR and whole genome sequencing is made important for the national reference laboratory for the uh, epidemiology reason. For the testing, the example like a forbat culture, we, as I told you that it's important that we need to find what is the suitable for our laboratory. We need to think about the property of the testing like a forbat culture for the sensitivity and mini minimum time to detect and cause different between conventional method and automated method for the sensitivity of the conventional is low and automated is high. And time to detect conventional is more than 24 hours and automated uh, use low, lower than 24 hours. But the di different thing is about the cost because the conventional is low cost and automated is high cost. If we are small laboratory and we have not much specimen each day, so we can use the conventional because if we use the automated machine, it may not the good benefit for the laboratory. And for the identification and AST is the same. We need to think about the suitable property for our laboratory. From the topic heading, I need to provide you some uh, example success story from Fleming Fund Timor Leste. 
for Timor Leste Framing Fund, we invest to the laboratory capacity strengthening by the Menzies School of Health Research. Our guarantee with the grant value about uh, 4 million pounds between May 2019 and until May 2021. Until today is almost complete two years. And for the laboratory capacity strengthening investment, it's about 34% of the fund provide or 1.4 million pound. And our strengthening not limited and, uh, to the laboratory diagnostic, but we include the laboratory innovation, IT infrastructure, equipment and consumable, staff training, SOP development, national EQA scheme, Exhibitment, budget planning, and strategic plan for the laboratory to support AMRs in the future. And for automated equipment, we purchase the equipment to replace the conventional method at the reference laboratory and some of selected Sentinel site. Why is only some selected Sentinel site? One important, one important thing about the for the framing fund, we think about the uh, we, we, we think about the sustainability because if we provide automated equipment to all laboratory, we sure that the government cannot maintain the system our, after the framing fund end this year because for automated equipment, uh, we need to pay for the maintenance every year we need to pay for the consumable that is expensive than the conventional method. That's why we provide it only to the uh, National Defense Laboratory and selected Sentinel site. The equipment that we provide to the laboratory is a uh, bad culture, BD back check for the uh, National Defense Laboratory and the National Hospital in, the, uh, in Delhi, Timor Leste. And for the identification, we provide Booker Monday Biotriper, Smart CA uh, for the identification. And for the AST, we provide BD Phoenix and Gene Expert System to the National Reference Laboratory. From the investment, the achievement until today that we get, a uh, number of bad culture correct and test increased 10 times before the capacity strengthen. And the rapid isolation of many significant pathogen facilitated from relay of the result back to clinician and led to the adjustment of antibiotic regimen. This service has no doubt safe life and allow for the rationalization of the antibiotic uses. I remember when I visit the a uh, provincial laboratory in Timor Leste first time. I asked a uh, doctor at the hospital that why you not send the laboratory testing for the infectious patient. And doctor told me that because when we send the specimen to the laboratory, it used very long time to, for the result, right? Uh, they need to wait until, wait for the one week or sometime maybe 10 day or two week until they get the result and they think it's not useful because if they're waiting for the result, they may missing to the patient treatment. And after reason is about the specimen transportation from the hospital to the laboratory is the real challenge for the demand stay because they have uh, the load condition is not good and they have no public transport system. That is uh, very difficult for them to send specimen from the hospital to the reference laboratory. That's why, that the reason why they uh, don't need to use the laboratory testing for the treatment. And because of this reason, before the filming fund start, we have very few specimen, around uh, 200 specimen per year for whole country. But after uh, the framing fund, as I told you that uh, 
we have specimen 10 times that about uh, 2,000 specimen per year for the first year. From our investment, we provide many uh, modernized modern laboratory equipment to them and they use uh, a short term for the report. Then we discovered the demolished state government and asked them to provide the extend the service hour from five day and eight hour per day to seven day, 24 hour to make sure that the result uh, sent to the clinician team in the real time after the result uh, issued by the automated automate, uh, equipment and the use of the gene expert to detect the first NDM carbapenemase that ever detect in the model stay result in sweet engagement of the MOH and clinician and laboratory staff in the process of detection of resistance and the need to use antibiotic appropriately. And the first antibiotic gram have been developed and socialized at a national hospital and regional different hospital. The first MR data will be shared to class this year. And not only this, the result from the laboratory testing and also from the antibiotic gram that we provide to the national hospital, they use the data for the uh, infection policy development to the national hospital and also provide to other referral hospital in country. As I told you in the beginning that uh, we not work in the modern state only, but we work with many countries in South Asia. We have some lesson learned in South East Asia from the framing fund. The first one is MR is low priority in the most country, especially when the COVID-19 situation, the MR is for some country when we start working for the framing fund, they form MR to work for the COVID-19. That is very challenging for the MR in Southeast Asia. And other thing for some country, they are limited supplier of the equipment and consumable in country. Like at Timor Leste, we have, they have no uh, distributor or reseller in country. Everything for the MR laboratory, they need to import from other country like Singapore, Australia, or Thailand. It's very really difficult for them to have the uh, long plan strategy for the inventory. And equipment maintenance in country is also sharing because they have no service provider. When equipment is broken, they need to import the engineer from Australia or Singapore for the equipment fix. That sometimes they need to waiting about two months, three months until equipment repairs. So it means that during that time, they cannot use the equipment for the lab testing. And they need to back to the uh, conventional method that cause of the lack of the confidence to the doctor to use the laboratory testing. And another thing as Dr. Dilek mentioned about the linked clinical and laboratory data together is the major challenge for the MR data collection. Because uh, for some country, from my experience, uh, they have that they have no central central system like that. For Thailand, we, we have the uh, centralized system that most of the microbiology laboratory use for the data correction. But for some country, they have their own system and their own system cannot talk together with the hospital information system. So it's very really difficult to link laboratory data from LIS to the clinical data from HIS 
because uh, they are lagging with the uh, middleware to connect it together. And after we work in one hospital to connect data between uh, HA8 and LS together, then when we submit the data to the data center, another problem is uh, the data platform between each hospital is different platform and it cannot combine together in the one time. So we need to uh, develop some software to uh, correct the data from each hospital together. But the MS system that Dr. Direk present, I think is very useful for the laboratory and the country to collect the data together. And a functional national reference laboratory is a vital for the MR surveillance because if we are lacking of the national reference laboratory, we cannot make sure that the data uh, provided by the hospital is accurate and good quality before we can provide, be, be, before we can share the data to the international community like a glass system. And long-term strategy to support the government are required to ensure sustainability of the investment. Uh, from my experience, many in, in low middle income country, they have many, many projects for many donors for the MR. And when each donor visit to the country and work with the country, they provide the equipment, they provide the resources to the country with their own strategy, but they sometimes they are lacking with the uh, strategy with the government, how to make it sustainable. And after the project end, some laboratory, they have a uh, three platform of the bad culture machine and three but platform of the automate identity, but they cannot use it because they, ha they have no budget for the maintenance, they have no budget for the uh, consumable because the project not discussed with the government and no strategy to support the government to ensure that government will be continue the system. That all from my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Paswat, so much. I'll just invite Derek and uh, Rajir back. Um, we're we're almost out of time. I just want uh, all those attendees that, that are that are on and everybody stayed on to this incredibly informative presentation of, of surveillance and all the efforts that are happening in Southeast Asia. I just posted the um, attendance code, but I'm going to go ahead and share uh, that on my my screen as well, so that you can all see this attendance code that I, you need to use to obtain when you go to the proce.com deadline by May 14th. Before you all hop off, um, there was a, a, a interesting question. They wanted to know um, the lack of surveillance, well, I should say surveillance in lower to middle income countries, is it because it's not being reported in a timely fashion uh, I don't know if it, some of the, the speakers can see this in the uh, question box there, or if it's just simply not being done at all. I don't know, Farajir, if you, you've got some, some thoughts on that, and I can also... Yeah, I, I, I just typed a very brief answer oh, did you, in the box okay, already, but, 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 um, but I mean, it's, it's a really good, it is a very good question and a good thing to think about. I mean, the fact that some countries are not reporting their data is that a problem if we look at the data and if uh, some of the samples are not collected at all in the first place and i, I tried to answer it quickly um and and this is in a way a large part of what acorn is about for for acorn we've we've particularly looked at uh using the data locally for clinical decision making and for putting guidelines together and then you see that the data that is currently co collected is just not very useful because it's not representative and because a lot of patients do not get their blood cultures collected so so 
then the question that Alex Kong asks is, yeah, these data are important, but not for that particular purpose. So if you want to use the data locally for your empiric treatment, then you need to make sure that the data is representative, all patients get sampled and the quality of the data is good. It seems that both of you have identified, uh, Roger and Dere, uh, that initially as you were collecting your data and doing your surveillance, that the people just weren't collecting the blood culture. And then Paswat described how for some, for some individuals, like, why should I collect one? Because it takes too long and I need to make a decision sooner than later. So it seems like that was a big moment of identifying that component because you talked about the bias in the data, for sure, but uh, Derek also, Derek also um, brought that up in his presentation as well. And it seems like as you collect surveillance data, your questions keep changing. Like, okay, if we're seeing this, then what about that? Does, does that, as you understand the biases in your data, you can refine it. Does that make sense? Is that what's happening to you, I guess? Uh, yes, many. I, uh, yes, I left my hand because I want to say exactly the same thing. I think it's about egg and hen for the question from Alex about the issues of not reporting or issue of not doing blood culture. But when you want to move the, the cycle so that the, the, the country have a better mechanism to cope with the AMR, you need a bit of the data and then you ask the questions and then more data will lead things better. But if you don't even have the data at all, no hospital share their own data, then the policy makers cannot do anything about that. And people can just uh, complain and cannot do it. So I think it, it can start by people showing their data. And then I, I can see that uh, the antibiogram or the report in, in the tier system, you can do it in the really old style isolate base, bulk everything together dot split between community acquired and hospital acquired, and then you can do it better with the community acquired hospital acquired. And then with the additional parameters like a blood culture utilization, and, and in the future with like an acorn that you can tell whether that antibiogram is certified before antibiotics or after failure of the first empirical antibiotics. And then those will guide you to the treatment better. So it, it always start to me, I think it always starts with the data and then it will make it better and better. So I think it's an egg and hen and we have to do something to make it happen. So and Paswa, it seems that with the Fleming Fund, that's part of what you're trying to do. You're trying to go to these regions and give them support infrastructure to obtain and expand data and surveillance. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, 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 because uh, the, we, before we, we start working with the region, uh, most of them are not provide the data to the class system. We try to identify what is the problem, why they not provide the data to the class system. For some country, they not provide because the government not interesting to provide it even they have uh, data available in country, maybe because with the politic issue. And for some country, they not provide because uh, they have no data available because they are lacking with the uh, laboratory to uh, testing or generate the data. For some country, they have data from the laboratory, but they have no authority or the middle people who can collect the data and uh, analyze the data and provide it to the government or the gas system. That from experience. Well, thank you for all your efforts. We are now out of time, but your presentations were just so informative. And I think it's just giving so much scope of what's possible, providing tools for people, uh, being able to reach experts and understand your efforts and what you're doing to contribute to understanding surveillance, which is where, Roger, you started the presentation of where are we going? How big is this really? And, and what can we do about it to prevent what some of the predictions are, are about? So we appreciate your efforts. I wish we had could come back another time and, and uh, you know, look at the data as you advance and expand. So 
have a good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are today. And thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much to our speakers and all their time and effort. Thank you for organizing. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Thank you everyone for listening. It's excellent. The presentation thank was recorded. Much, so please share this with your friends. We'll be posting it on our website. And thank you to our supporter, uh, Beckton Dickinson Company, BD.